This is the Dollamore Daily, and I'm Jesse Dollamore. You may have heard that uber billionaire Michael Bloomberg has entered the 2020 race for President of the United States. The man who is richer than 392 of the very richest 400 Americans has decided, in the face of over a dozen other highly capable and qualified candidates, that he is supremely and distinctively more competent for the highest office in our nation than are any of them. The man who was for years the Republican mayor of New York City has decided it's time for him to be our Democrat president. Now, before I go any further, it must be said that I believe we should all encourage one another to change our minds when we hold bad, wrong opinions about matters. I am, in fact, two videos into a series entitled Why I Left the Republican Party. So I won't complain that Michael Bloomberg hasn't been a member of the Democratic Party his entire adult life. I'm not even going to say he's an intrinsically distasteful candidate because of his $54,000 million. Well, what I am going to complain about and argue is that Michael Bloomberg was so wrong about something for so long that was so easily recognizable as terrible and that he is only just now apologizing for that he is simply unfit to be president of these United States. And I'm of course talking about stop and frisk. Before I get into some of the horrifying details of stop and frisk, which are sure to shock you if you're unaware of them and re-enrage you if you already know about them, I want to play for you his short one minute and 49 second campaign announcement video to see if you notice what I did. Mike Bloomberg started as a middle class kid who had to work his way through college, then built a business from a single room to a global entity, creating tens of thousands of good paying jobs along the way. He could have stopped there. But when New York suffered the terrible tragedy of 9-11, he took charge, becoming a three-term mayor who brought a city back from the ashes and brought back jobs and hope with it, creating tens of thousands of affordable housing units so families could have a decent place to live, raising teachers' salaries and kids' graduation rates, and creating a more open and livable city for the millions who call it home. He could have stopped there. But when he witnessed the terrible toll of gun violence, he put his money where his heart is, helping to create a movement to take on the NRA and the politicians they own to protect families across this country and help turn the tide. And he's funded college educations for thousands of deserving low-income and middle-class kids and supported life-saving medical research and stood up to the coal lobby and the outright denial of this administration to protect the only home we have from the growing menace of climate change. But now he sees a different kind of menace coming from Washington. So there's no stopping here. Because there's an America waiting to be rebuilt, where everyone without health insurance is guaranteed to get it, and everyone who likes theirs can go ahead and keep it. Where the wealthy will pay more in taxes, and the struggling middle class will get their fair share. And jobs that just allow you to get by will become jobs that let you get ahead. Mike Bloomberg for president, jobs creator, leader, problem solver. It's going to take all three to build back a country. That is quite the campaign opener. He was able to reference Donald Trump. He was sure to include some obligatory 9-11 references and footage, just in case you forgot he was the mayor the year after September 11th happened. And of course, there were lots of pictures of him. Classic campaign ad. The other part of this that strikes me, especially when accompanied by emotional music to drive home just how much he cares, is how many black and brown people were prominently featured. The same types of people who were systemically terrorized by Michael Bloomberg and his stop and frisk policing policy year after year after year, after year, while he was mayor 
of New York City. A policy which he fought for and championed and justified and defended up until as recently as last year. First, what was stop and frisk? Well, stop and frisk was a policing practice that when used in New York City was found by a federal court to be a systematic violation of the 4th and 14th Amendment constitutional rights of American citizens who were subjected to it. It worked like this. A New York City cop would detain innocent citizens, interrogate innocent citizens, and search innocent citizens for weapons and other items thus violating their constitutionally protected rights against unreasonable search and seizure, as well as equal protection under the law. In the court's 2013 ruling in the case against the practice, Judge Shira Schindlin wrote, in conclusion, I find that the city is liable for violating plaintiff's fourth and 14th amendment rights. The city acted with deliberate indifference toward the NYPD's practice of making unconstitutional stops and conducting unconstitutional frisks. Here are some numbers related to Bloomberg's stop and frisk program. You see, Michael Bloomberg took over as mayor of New York City in 2002 and remained in office through 2013. So we have lots and lots of data at our fingertips concerning this draconian policy of citizen harassment. Under Michael Bloomberg, the practice of stop and frisk exploded. The year prior to his becoming mayor, there were 97,296 stops, interrogations, and searches. That number under then Mayor Rudy Giuliani was bad enough. But after Bloomberg took office, the program went completely crazy. So much that by 2011, there were 685,724 stops, interrogations, and searches of citizens, which may seem fine to some who somehow believe that the policy was carried out in a reasonable and measured manner by police who exist to protect and to serve and who took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York and to faithfully discharge their duties as police officers in the New York City Police Department to the best of their abilities. That isn't what happened though. The New York Civil Liberties Union analyzed the NYPD's own publicly available data and found that millions of times Innocent New Yorkers were illegally subjected to police stops, interrogations, and searches. In fact, in more than 5 million times that they occurred between 2002 and 2013, nearly 9 out of 10 stopped and frisked New Yorkers were found to be completely innocent. Stopped and searched and harassed by armed agents of the state for no reason. And the overwhelming number of that nearly 90% were black and brown people, according to Time Magazine, but the stops did not affect New Yorkers uniformly. The vast majority occurred in lower income minority neighborhoods. From 2003 to 2008, the highest cumulative number of stops occurred in poorer neighborhoods such as East Harlem, Brooklyn's East New York, and Jamaica, Queens. The neighborhoods with the lowest number of stops were wealthier parts of the city such as downtown and midtown Manhattan and Brooklyn's Park Slope. In 52% of 4.4 million stops between 2004 and 2012, the person stopped was black. In 31%, the person was Hispanic. In a city that's almost 45% white, almost 85% of the people stopped and frisked by Bloomberg's police force were people of color. This fact was not lost on Judge Shindland, who wrote, this case is about the tension between liberty and public safety. 
in each of these stops, a person's life was interrupted. And Time Magazine wrote describing the judge's ruling as a potential blow to the legacy of New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who has vigorously defended the policy as integral to the 30% drop in violent crime during his 12-year tenure. Quote, Nowhere in her 195-page decision does she mention the historic cuts in crime or the number of lives that have been saved, unquote. Bloomberg said, vowing to appeal the decision. So let's talk about that. Since this thuggish stop-and-frisk policy was ramped up in an effort to get guns off the street, how effective was it? Mother Jones wrote at the time, the rising number of stops in recent years has not led to a bounty of illicit goods. Only a very small percentage of the searches led to a discovery of weapons, drugs, or stolen items. And lo and behold, and as this chart demonstrates, black New Yorkers are far more likely than whites to be stopped needlessly. Look at that. White people who were searched 10% of the time and less were holding weapons and contraband at over five times the rates of black New Yorkers. And specific statistics about guns found, reading from 538.com, beginning in 2007, the New York Civil Liberties Union filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests to get the NYPD's data on its stop and frisk encounters and what was found. In 2012, the NYPD made more than 532,000 stops, each of which could progress to a frisk or to a full search. The police found guns only 715 times. In other words, guns were found during 0.1% of stops. Now I'm going to repeat that for the sake of impact. Guns were only found during 0.1% of these stops, interrogations, and searches. So Democrat and then Republican and now Democrat again, Michael Bloomberg, would have us believe that even though he defended and advocated for this policy up until only a matter of a few short months ago, the policy of detain, interrogate, and illegally search, even though he's on record just last year evangelizing the efficacy of this racially discriminatory system of harassment and abuse that now he's finally seen the light and wants you to believe his apology has something to do with other than the fact that he's running for president now as a Democrat. Because listen to his apology. And somebody explained to me what has changed since only a few months ago. But my final year in office, supported for the development, support for the department had eroded and the main reason was the practice of something called stop and frisk. Our focus was on saving lives. The fact is, far too many innocent people were being stopped while we tried to do that. And the overwhelming majority of them were black and Latino. That may have included, I'm sorry to say, some of you here today. Perhaps yourself, or your children, or your grandchildren, or your neighbors, or your relatives. I spoke with many of the innocent people affected and listened to their frustrations and their anger. And as I said at the time, I'd be angry too. But because of the numbers of stops of innocent people, because it had been so high, resentment had built up. And we eroded what we had worked so hard to build, trust. Trust between police and communities, trust between you and me. And the erosion of that trust bothered me deeply. And it still bothers me. And I want to earn it back. After you leave office, you have a chance to reflect on what you did well and what you could have done better. A lot of people tell you what you could have done better. Well, in recent months, as I've thought about my future, I've been thinking more about my past 
and coming to terms where I came up short. I talked about the issue of stops with people I know and respect from different communities, friends, civic leaders, educators, and staff members. I always believe that leadership involves listening and reading and respecting diverse viewpoints and acknowledging when you didn't get them right. Over time, I've come to understand something that I long struggled to admit to myself. I got something important wrong. I got something important really wrong. I didn't understand that back then, the full impact that stops were having on the black and Latino communities. Now, hindsight is 2020. But as crime continued to come down as we reduced stops, and as it continued to come down during the next administration, to its credit, I now see that we could and should have acted sooner and acted faster to cut the stops. I wish we had. I'm sorry that we didn't. But I can't change history. However, today, I want you to know that I realized back then I was wrong. And I'm sorry. Listen, here's the deal. Here's the reason I have such a problem with this. If Michael Bloomberg were just a regular guy, just a guy on the street with a dopey opinion about stop and frisk, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But when someone is imbued with the power of a position like mayor of the largest city in the United States of America, and with it, the largest armed force in the nation, short of the United States military itself, well then, that's different. With power and authority come responsibility. And I don't believe after screwing up this badly with the sacred trust of the public that he should just be given another crack at it. I wanna know what you think though. I would invite you to agree or disagree in the comments and uh, let's talk about it.